Good morning. Today I'm going to share some of my thoughts about a scripture from Romans chapter 12 where we are told to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This is connected to Paul's teaching in chapter 11 where he exhorts us to be humble rather than conceited, to remember that none of us is better than the other, all having been grafted into the root of the same olive tree and all receiving God's mercy through his grace. Graham made a very profound statement previously which speaks into this idea. He said, God in his grace gives us what we do not deserve and in his mercy does not give us what we do deserve. This puts us all on equal footing in the presence of God. I will read now from Romans chapter 12 verse 33 through to chapter 12 verse 3. Reading from chapter 11 33, my apologies. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory for ever. Amen. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Every time I find myself ruffling my feathers at something which is said or done, or I find myself falling into an unwanted pattern of behaviour, or even repeated sinful behaviour, I remind myself of the directive to continually renew my mind. I have often referred back to the teaching by Brain and Peace from Christianity Oasis Online in this regard, and will be making reference to his teaching as I work through this devotion this morning. Brandon Peace compares the mind to a garden, where someone who does not want the garden to flourish spreads the seeds of weeds. Another cause of weed population is carrying in of seeds on the soles of shoes that have been walking through the weeds or even our clothes. Yet another cause would be bird poop or animal fur or some other vehicle of weed seeds. As we all know, once this happens and the weeds grow, weeding a garden then becomes a lifetime effort. Just when we think we have pulled all the weeds, whammo, the weeds start all over again. Life, as it is lived, litters our minds with the weeds of our experiences, our failures, our relationships, negative words, abusive situations, jealousies, abandonment, loss, insecurities, etc. All of these shape who we become and how we respond to life and what it dishes up for us. These weeds teach us to put up defences, to become reactive or aggressive rather than responsive, to become cynical or, or controlling, to become withdrawn and mistrusting, and so many other things to boot. Another thing about weeds is that many of them have different root systems. Some have, be, have very deep tap roots that make them extremely difficult to uproot. Others have secondary roots that spread sideways and pull a lot of the good plants around them out as well as as well as they are uprooted. Yet others have bulbs which do not come out with pulling and which multiply profusely if not removed. They have to be dug out. Others are ground covers which root themselves all over the place and make a really good job of outgrowing anything else in their chosen spot. This is the same with many of the burdens we carry within our souls. Some are easier to uproot and to let go of than others. And then there are those that we need to dig deep to find the source and, and to uproot it. Others still we need to remove with care, in case we damage the good things in our lives. And then there are those that have intertwined themselves so much into the course and fiber of our lives that it takes many repeated efforts to get rid of them. These weeds also tend to sap the soil of our gardens, of it all its goodness. And if we do not remove them, they do in fact kill most of the good things we have in a garden and leave the garden looking unkempt and uninviting. The only way to fix the garden is to uproot and get rid of those weeds, refertilize the ground and then plant or replant the beautiful plants that make the garden a place of pleasure. Poisoning the weeds may lead to the death of other good plants. 
general uprooting of the entire garden will destroy all the good plants as well as the weeds. The only way to do the job effectively is to regularly, daily inspect the garden, identify the weeds, uproot them and get rid of them. Overfertilizing can also be destructive in its outcome, so this needs to be done with care and also on a regular basis to keep the ground healthy in which the plants can successfully grow without the choking interference of the weeds. If we consider the burdens of our souls and the energy it takes to carry the burdens through everyday life, I'm pretty sure that each one of us can testify to just how destructive they can be to our daily walk with Jesus through this world into which we were born. Science tells us that unresolved emotions and traumas can cause physical harm to our bodies and many believe that certain illnesses are directly a result of such unresolved emotions and traumas. I have had to work through a good number of memories and traumas which have affected my personality and my worldview. Some were easier to come to terms with and to release into the hands of the Holy Spirit for Him to bring healing to my soul. Others were more difficult to release for fear of being vulnerable again and possibly having to experience the hurt all over again. Still others only surfaced once I had dealt with previous and seemingly easier issues. In all honesty, it is a daily process of introspection and surrender to work through the lifetime of weeds in my soul that went by unnoticed or even ignored. For all of us, this is a time-consuming process in which we need to weed as much out as we can in that moment and then allow the Holy Spirit to heal and fertilize the soil once again. Let us consider what Paul is teaching us through this passage. I believe he is suggesting that pride and also conceit are the roots of the contamination of the mind. These traits lead us, without fail, into the pattern of life of the world and human nature makes it much easier to conform to the patterns of this world than to stand against them. We don't want to make a spectacle of ourselves or to draw attention to ourselves or be embarrassed or seem to be failing in the, eye, in the eyes of those around us. This leads us to simply behave in what we perceive to be the socially acceptable pattern for the particular circumstance of the moment. So what should our approach to life be then? Paul marvels at our Creator. He says, O oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. I would suggest that the first step in the process of weeding would be to get to know our God. The only way to get to know his mind and to get to know his judgments, to understand his paths, to get to experience his wisdom and knowledge is to read his word. When we surrender our minds to him and we read his word without cynicism and with childlike faith, his word becomes a lamp. His word will give us wisdom and guidance and even strength. It becomes the fertilizer with which we enrich the soil of our lives. I would suggest the daily smaller doses of God's word and giving ourselves time to digest and meditate upon what we have read is more effective than less regular and larger doses of God's word, which can be quite overwhelming and intimidating at times. Paul then says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In an act of gratitude for God's mercy, that he does not give us what we deserve, Paul urges us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. In other words, we do not put ourselves on an altar of deathly sacrifice. Rather, we surrender who we are, how we live our lives, how we think, what we do, where we go, how we entertain ourselves, our whole beings, to his will for us. His will is clearly laid out in his word. So again, get to know his word. Then, he, then Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He does not urge us to try. No, he simply says, do not do it. When we refuse to conform to the world, then we will experience God's hand in our lives in ways that we could not begin to imagine. Paul says we will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. We will not experience God's will if we do not get to know his will, or if we ignore his will, or if we do not surrender ourselves as a living sacrifice to his will. 
Paul's final exhortation in this passage I read is for us to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but rather to think of ourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of us. None of us is more special than the next, that we should feel we are exempt in any way from having to humble ourselves and to resist or refuse conforming to the pattern of this world. We are also not in any position to judge anyone for their approach to walking through life, since each of us is on a journey of faith. As we get to know God's word better and better, so our faith begins to grow and to change us. But we have to deliberately practice our faith against the inevitable doubts that will plague our minds. We have to take the weed of doubt and surrender it to the fertilizer of faith in the plan that God has for our personal garden. Humility will also help us to understand that God's plan for our garden is not necessarily our plan for our garden. It is also to our advantage to remember that gardening is a game of patience. What we plant today will not bloom today. It only blooms when it, it, its time for blooming comes, and it may never bloom if weeds are allowed to choke it out. We need to practice sober judgment. I believe this to be a sober reflection, reflection of ourselves in daily uprooting weeds and that could spread over and restrict our freedom to walk in victory along the path of life. In the words of Brandon Peace, it is good to remember that we all make mistakes, we fall, sin gets in our way, temptation surrounds us and we don't always resist. But that is exactly why God sent his son Jesus to die for us and to give us the free gift of grace. He wants us to receive forgiveness and keep fighting the good fight of faith. So when you find yourself struggling with feelings of failure, unworthiness, fear, weakness or shame, just remember that God loves you so very much and he wants you to get back up when you stumble. Persevere, never give up. Do the necessary weeding and fertilizing and move on in his grace and praise in victory. Remember also, the more you put into something, the more you get out of it. Paul also exhorts us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians 2 verse 12. It is hard work to walk as a child of God. It is humbling to see how easily we allow weeds to encroach on our lives. But it is also awesome to know that if we surrender daily and lift out the weeds and expose them, the gardener of all gardeners will prune, fertilize, refresh, plant and create the most breathtaking garden and bring pleasure and rest to our soul and to our spirit. Father God, we come before you now and ask you to show us the weeds we have allowed to encroach on our relationship with you and with the world around us. Expose them, Father, to the light of your word. And we ask that you will give us the courage, the boldness and the strength to turn our backs on the patterns of the world and to walk in faith and in victory according to your will for each of us. Let your name be glorified in the gardens of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.